الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد وبعد Now, as we mentioned, this matter is a big one, it's huge. But we hope that by going through some of the points, we can properly get to the end of what we're supposed to reach. So far, we're just introducing you to the thought of Muhammad Abdul Wahab, his beliefs, his history, and the fact that he sent out literature to other scholars calling them to his movement. And we've reached where the scholars have actually answered these issues. And they've written back and said, yes, we accept this, or yes, this, what you've said, is correct in the sense that the people are doing wrong, but it's not major kufr. And what you have said is incorrect. And then they've gone further and said that these people, this man is astray, and this group is astray. Now, where we come to, we had read a lengthy paragraph that was quoted to us. It covered a number of pages by Sheikh Suleiman ibn Suhaim al Zubayr. We now come to another alim, which is Imam Abdullah ibn Suhaim. May Allah be pleased with him. He also weighed in when he received two of the Muwahid, Muwahidun missionaries, Hassan ibn Aidan and an armed guard. And in the course of conversation, realized that the two had likened Allah to his creation. Further to this, the common people rejected him and sent him away. This forced Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab to backpedal on his theology, but upon realization that the Imam would not relent, Ibn Abdul Wahab resorted to calling him an unbeliever. Now I want you to listen to this quote. Muhammad Abdul Wahab on footnote 112, he said, quote, so then if some doubt has still come into your heart after all of this, then turn to the turner of the hearts so that he might guide you to his religion and the religion of his prophet. Close quote. So he's very clearly saying that this man, in Tariq Nej, pages 285 to 286, he's very clearly saying that if you're doubting in who this person is, then this individual who I've written to needs to turn to Allah and come to his religion. Now, why was there a problem between Muhammad Abdul Wahab and Shaykh Abdullah bin Suhaim? Well, because the people of Washam asked them, what do you say about Allah? And they give a number of statements and they say, do you state that Allah is not in need of resembling his creation? That Allah is not in need of a body or these other things? And they said, we do not. We neither confirm nor deny. So the people of Wesham immediately expelled them because they said, no, these people are mushriks because we know that Allah does not resemble his creation. Now this is coming from footnote number 111. Now this is what happened. In an attempt to sweeten the matter, Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab attempted to appear conciliatory. The people of Wesham attacked and repudiated anyone who did not state that Allah was not in need of a substance, body, or parts. This repudiation from them has two points. The person did not understand the words of Ibn Aidan and his colleague. And number two, the person did not understand the form of the question. The reason for this is that in the method of Imam Ahmed and others from the early generations, they did not speak about this matter except with what Allah and his messenger spoke of in that regard. So whatever Allah established and affirmed for himself or what was affirmed by his messenger, then the early generations established it. This includes things like aboveness, istiwa, speech, coming and going, and other things. Whatever Allah negated from himself, or what was negated by his messenger, they likewise negated it. This includes things like having a likeness, rival, or equal, and so forth. Things that have not been established or negated by Allah and his messenger, for example, his being a substance, element, or being in a direction, then the early generations neither affirmed nor denied. So, the one that should say that Allah does not possess these things, the very things that Hassan ibn Aidan and his companion did not reject him possessing, then according to Ahmed in the early generations, that person is an innovator. Tariq Najd, pages 247 to 248, close quote. So what he's saying is, for someone to say that Allah possesses, possesses a body, or has these things, that wasn't ever spoken of by the early generations. That Allah has a body or pupils or things like this. That wasn't said by the early generations. They neither confirmed nor denied. This is, this is a matter of dispute. I want you to read the next portion. 
This statement shows that from the beginning, the creed of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his followers was different to that of Muslim orthodoxy. Let's look at the words of the early imams on the topic. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab said that the early generations never denied or affirmed these things. In reality, his claim is patently false. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah states, the things, quote, the things are taken from the revealed law and the Arabic language. The people who use the language have used the word body for something that has height, breadth, thickness, construction, form, and composition, while Allah most high is beyond being described as a body. This has not been mentioned in the revealed law, therefore it is refuted. Al-I'tiqad, pages 22 to 23. This is a very important point. So when Allah says things about himself, there's no thing like him, he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Whatever is a limit or anything such as this, we negate it. Because Allah says there's no thing like him. Further to this, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah stated, he is not in need of a body, substance, or element. There is no limit for him, opposite or rival. This is the text of Al-Fiqh al-Akbar, paragraph number seven. So this shows that declaring Allah different to his creation and not in need of these things was understood by the early generations. It is only Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his organization that opposed them. And I said at the end, may Allah bless the people of Al-Arid and the surrounding Al-Washim Sudayr and Al-Ahsad because they stood for that which was true. Because these people said, no, by you saying that Allah resembling his creation in terms of possessing a body and these other things, that this is a matter of dispute that the early generations didn't speak about. That's a lie. And the people of Al-Washim immediately said, no, you have, a different, you have a different deen to us, a different religion to us, a different creed to us. Because everyone knows, the Sunnis understand, if someone says, well, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in need of a body? No, he's not in need of any resemblance to his creation. Imam Ahmed said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's, it's impermissible to confirm these things for him. Because there are limits. Bodies have height, breadth, depth. We don't ascribe any limit to Allah. Now, when the Muwahidun cult asked Imam Abdul Muhsin ibn Ali al ushaiqi may Allah be pleased with him to become a member, his reply was not favorable. Imam Muhammad ibn Fayruz al-Hanbali said of Imam Abdul Muhsin ibn Ali al ushaiqi and his resistance to the Muwahidun movement, quote, he came from our land and learned from our people. He learned the Muqtasar al muqni' from his father and did so up until the Book of Inheritance. Then his father died and he studied al-Muntaha until he completed it and became a jurist. He had great manners and a wide knowledge of fiqh, inheritance, math, and Arabic. He authored a book in refutation of that oppressive and transgressing innovator, quoted from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his student ibn al The people of Az-Zubayr then asked me to give permission for him to be their imam and teacher on Fridays and their expounder in law. I gave permission and he traveled to them and was an honor for them and he was respected and his words were accepted by them. This went on until Allah caused him to die a martyr due to plague at the end of Dhul-Hijjah in the year 1187. Close quote. Now this is interesting because he was one of the Qadis, he was one of the Qadis in Riyadh, and he was also one of the Qadis in Kuwait. Now when you think of Riyadh, you think Salafiyah, but it wasn't like that then. Kuwait didn't have these issues back then. Now, brother, could you read from Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hajj Ahmad al-Safari who wrote a word? Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hajj Ahmad al-Safari wrote a work Answers on Najd regarding questions about Najd. It is one of the major works about the cult and still remains a classic. Again, from another contemporary, he also wrote four volumes of information on creed, clarifying the identity of Muslim orthodoxy. He stated in one text regarding the danger of accusing Muslims of being unbelievers. So when uh, so when mention is made of some evil, so, so when mention is made of some of the evil thoughts and actions of the people of innovation and strainers and you label them with a strainness and carrying falsehood. The text of the author, may Allah have mercy on him, mentioned this matter after making clear the way of the people of truth and the path of the companions of the true way and certainty. It was as if he was saying that the, that was that what it that what is compulsory to believe had already been made clear regarding those who differ with us from the people of innovation, so beware that you speak their statements. Believe as they do, and when you understand all of that, you need to stick with the mother of the people of truth. So you are not to, to believe in labeling as unbelievers the people who pray and they have established one of the pillars of, uh, of Islam and basic points of the religion. It is impermissible to kill them. 
Kufr is the opposite of faith and the unbeliever who did the act is called either ungrateful or a true unbeliever. This is based on the pronunciation of the word, its roots and so forth. Then there is the hadith, whoever said to his brother, unbeliever, then one of them is that. The reason for that is that he is either telling the truth or he is lying. If he is telling the truth, then the person referring to is an unbeliever. If he is lying, then the charge of kufr returns to him due to his labeling his Muslim brother as unbeliever. Right. Please continue. Imam Muhammad al safari also wrote a text with one of his teachers, Shihabuddin al-Mannini, regarding Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab being a false prophet and the conditions of which they had. The text was another rallying cry for Orthodox Muslims. Imam Isa al qurdumi may Allah be pleased with him, was instrumental in preaching against the movement. He delivered letters and so forth. This Imam classified them as the Khawarij. He was a curer. He was a, he was a curio for Imam Muhammad ibn al uh, al -Hab al Haj Ahmad al Safarini, who wrote answers on Najd regarding questions about Najd. Why? Brother, could you please read from Imam Saif ibn Ahmad al Atiqi? Imam Saif ibn Ahmad al Atiqi, may Allah have mercy on him, also rejected the pamphlets sent out by self organization. Imam ibn Sulaim, may Allah be pleased with him, rejected Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's false ideas. Imam Muhammad Suleiman al Qurdi, may Allah be pleased with him. Reiterated numerous times. Praise be to Allah alone. There is no doubt to the, in that, that the knowledge of deriving rulings is taken from scholars. So whoever has his books as his share, then his mistakes are more than when he is correct. The, cl this claim, the claims of absolute ishtihad today are generally coming from a slave who is far from uh, from far from it. Imams are um, Raf, Rafi and Nawi and those who preceded them, like Fakhuddin uh, Ar-Razi, have, have come to agree then as today that there are no absolute uh, much doubts. Imam Ibn Hajar al-Haytami al has mentioned in his rulings that there, is n that, that there has not been an absolute uh, mujtahid since Imam al-Shafi and his contemporaries. Imam Ibn al has said it has been more than three centuries since an absolute mujtahid has existed. Okay, now here's something important. <coughs> when Salafiyah came, it said, particularly Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, we are going back to the book and sunnah. We're not going to worry about any madhabs. Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbi, these are like different religions. We're going straight back to the books. Well, wait a minute, how are you going to do this? Because these people were absolute mujtahids, or were taking from the same source they're taking from. But you didn't memorize all the literature that they memorized. Yes, but when you go back to the text, you just make dua and Allah will help you. Yeah, that, that's true if you have the information, though. You don't have all the information. So what happens is you have two types of people. If someone says, I don't follow any imam in, that, in my religion, this person is what is called an absolute mujtahid. This means that they go through all of the texts. So, there are 500 collections of a hadith, which means there are 1 million a hadith in number. There are 6,236 verses. Verses. If you're an absolute mujtahid, you don't follow anyone when you make ijtihad at all. You say, I'm going straight back to the books. But the problem is, for being an absolute mujtahid, you not only need to have memorized all that information and know it, but also an absolute mujtahid has to have trained you to have taught you. Now what Imam Muhammad Suleiman al-Kurdi, who's Shafi, what he's saying is, all of these Imams from before said, there have not been absolute mujtahids since Imam Shafi and his contemporaries. Now, Imam Shafi and his contemporaries are Imam Ahmed, people like this. So when Imam Ahmed had the shovel of dirt put over his head, that was the end of the age of absolute mujtahids. That's finished. There was no one after that memorized all of the hadith. All of the Quran. There was no one like that after. You had people that had different qualities. Imam Manawi memorized, obviously, the Quran at a level of a hadith. Imam Hajjatul Islam Abu Hamid Ghazali, he memorized the Quran and a certain massive number of a hadith. But you did not have anyone that had memorized that number and was an absolute mujtahid because the people necessary to make them no longer exist. So when someone says, I don't, I don't follow anyone in my religion. 
Okay, you don't follow any one of your religion. So then how do you come to conclusions when you're stuck or you, or you struggle? Because there have been four mentionings in the Qur'an of a class of people, a clerical class of people called scholars, that are the ulul amr, they're the people who have control, that you ask them when you don't know. Oh no, what I do is I compare the proofs. You compare the proofs? Yes. All right, there are 500 ahadith on salah. Are you able to compare the proofs? There are 500 ahadith on salah alone. You're able to compare the proofs? And the level of the Arabic that's spoken, I mean, just a simple, let me just give you a simple example of something. The ahadith about when, when talaq is delivered, the Hanbis and Hanafis say that the sign for the end of a marriage is that the woman has to wait one monthly cycle. The Shafi'is and the Maliki say, no, it's one period of purity. So we say, oh, well, let's just go back to the pure Quran and Sunnah. We get to the bottom of it, find out who's wrong, who's right. Go back, look. The word used is thalathatu quru'in. Three quru. The singular is the word qar. Oh, okay, well, we'll just go to the Arabic dictionaries, get it sorted out. Somebody's got to be wrong, don't they? So we go back, and we find the word qar. <coughs> What does the word qar mean? We say if, we, if the word means menstruation, we know it's three menstruations, or it's one menstruation. If it's one period of purity, we know it's one period of purity. We go back and find that this word signifies both purity and menstruation. Okay, well, there's got to be the stronger evidence. And you go to them, and they've all got strong evidence. They've all got strong evidence. Okay, let's go back to the linguistics. Go back to the oldest Arabic dictionaries. Go back to the Arabic dictionaries. This could mean purity and menstruation. Now, these are the people, absolute mujtahids, that have delved into these matters, isolated things, and not only that, they've learned from the companions. It's not that these people, Ahmed is not in isolation. Ahmed actually is learning his creed and his understanding of hadith from people who knew people who saw the Prophet Right? Imam Abu Hanifa is learning from people who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam is learning from people who learn from people who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Shafi'i the same thing. So when they're looking at hadith, they can come to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and say, what did you mean by this hadith? You can't do that today. You don't have people at the level where they can go through 500 collections. We're amazed today when we find, yes, so-and-so memorized Siha Sitta. Siha Sitta, that's about... If you do that with the Musnad, that's about 70, 60,000 ahadith. You know what? Those people couldn't even sit in a class with Ahmed ibn Hanbal. You can't sit with Ahmed ibn Hanbal. You could not sit with him unless someone sat with him once and said, Imam, he said, is someone a faqih if they memorize 100,000? No. 200,000? No. 300,000? No. 400,000? He said, about that. So Imam's Muslim. Bukhari, Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood was at the level of 500,000. Abu Bakr al-Athram learned 700,000. Muslim knew 400,000. Bukhari knew 500,000. No one under that bar could sit in his class. You could give him salam if he was in the masjid. He was praying, oh, Imam Ahmed, give him salam. Oh, yes, brother, nice to meet you. But you'd get shoved off because you don't, you, don't any, you don't know any proper hadith. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, his classes, you come into his classes, and these are people that knew all the qira' of the Qur'an. Not just Warsh and Asim, all of them. Not just Hafs and Asim, but they knew Warsh and Nafiya, Qalu, they knew all of them. So when someone comes to Imam Hanifa, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al shaybani and says, I want to join your hadith class, have you finished the Qur'an? No, come back when you finish the Qur'an. He comes back seven days later, he says, I want to join your class. I told you, you have to finish the Qur'an. He says, I have. Seven days, you finished it. And that's not just, oh, he's done Hafs and Asim. No, that's all of them. That's all the qira'ah. So when someone comes to you and says, yeah, I don't, I don't follow, I don't follow uh, the methods or whatever else. Oh, subhanAllah, we haven't seen the like of you for 1,200 years. An absolute mujtahid. We need to get some issues resolved. You pull up the chair, say, okay, well, we need to ask you about modern day issues of inheritance. And because this person is an absolute mujtahid, they can go straight through all of the texts and resolve issues. So we want to sit with these people. I've always said, if you meet anyone that says, I don't follow any methods, I only follow Quran and Sunnah, let me meet these people because obviously they're absolute mujtahids. And then when you meet them, you find out they're not, they haven't memorized the Quran. 
You look in their house and it's always the same thing. The first volume of Sahih al-Bukhari is missing. And the tafsir on Juz Amma. Those are the two cores. Okay, I've got, I've got Salah. I'm going to go through that. And then I'm going to do Juz Amma. And I've memorized that. And then when I've done the 40 hadith in Imam Nawi, I become one of the ulama. Yeah, this brother, he's memorized the 40 hadith in Imam Nawi. He can't even talk yet in hadith. This man's done Juz Amma. He can't even talk yet in, in the Quran. He's nothing. He's not, even, he's not even a threat. He can, okay, he can lead Salah in his house. But in the masjid, people go, what are you doing? Get back, man. If he tries to correct the imam and tarawih, he gets taken to the side. Listen, don't do that again. He gets corrected. Because he's nothing. So you have to understand, this is the ruling that these people have. All right, brother, could you read please where the imam says, on page 40, where it says the imam says further. The imam says further, the one who is claiming this, it is necessary such a one return to the truth and abandon, and abandon false hopes. With regard to this, with regard to his calling Muslims and believers, then it has been explicitly stated by the Messenger of Allah When the man says to the other unbeliever, then one of them is an unbeliever. So the one who is throwing such a charge to Muslim is that unbeliever according to Ashar al-Qubar al-Qabr al-Imam al-Rafi. The Imam continues, this is because this is because he is calling Islam Kufar, and this is followed by Imam al Nawi, and it is dependent upon ruling for the, for the latter day scholars of the of the school. Okay, so the Imam is saying because he said this, he's calling other Muslims unbelievers. He's a kafir, and because he's claiming that he's at this level, he's guilty of kufr, because he is leading people astray. All right, brother, could you please continue with Imam Suleiman Abu Hamdan? Imam Suleiman Abu Hamdan, may Allah be pleased with him was a famous teacher by this time and was one of the first five scholars to write a book against the movement and the first to systematically organize all the most severe beliefs under headings. The first book, Divine Lightning, was written around the year 1162, while the final and more expanded work, Divine Lightning, the decisive speech, was written from his study in Sudair before he was captured in the year 1190, tortured and enslaved, the book in your hands in Latin Okay, so Imam Suleiman Abdul Wahab, who wrote this book in 1190 A.H., he was captured in battle. He was fighting against other people. He was captured in battle, tortured, and brought in chains and enslaved. And he died. So this book that you hold in your hand is from a man who pretty much died shaheed. And we've never, ever had the opportunity to see this in English until now. How many other? There were numerous other scholars. He's not the only one. There are numerous other scholars. And this man was killed. He was murdered because of resisting Salafiyah. Now, brother, could you please read from Imam Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Fayruz? Imam Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Fayruz al Hadri, may Allah be pleased with him, in his response letter proclaimed, I swear to dedicate my life until I reach the level of ijtihad, and then I will fight this innovation. He also stated, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers are people of innovation because they contradict all of that which has been handed down. Imam Alawi al Haddad, may Allah be pleased with him, in his work, The Illuminated Lamp, in clarifying the dangers and darkness of the one coming from Naj that has led common people astray, preached. And this, uh, and as we had mentioned from the Sheikh, the learner, the wise one, Sheikh Afif Uddin Abdullah ibn Dawood al Hambali al Basri, it is the case that he claimed prophethood implicitly, but not outright and he did not expose his affair in the beginning. He said in another chapter, in one chapter we will speak about the kufr of what, what the wretched Naji uh, said about the Imam Abu Hanifa uh, not being upon anything and refusing to follow the Imams, their books, rulings, and conclusions. Okay, now let's look at this very quickly. For those that may not be familiar, Imam Alawi al-Haddad is from the household of the Prophet He's Ahlul Bayt, from Yemen. The Haddad are a famous family. They're related to today's Habaib. The, many of you remember from Imam uh, Habib al Jifr, right? Habib Omar. Haddads are related to them. So these are the people that saw it and condemned it straight away. These people that we're quoting from are people that met Muhammad Rabbi Wahab personally. They either met him or knew of him, read his books. So none of what we're talking about today are, oh, it's just some guy somewhere they never knew him. No, they met him personally. That's why it's so important that I'm quoting this, because they knew him personally. Now, they state something very interesting. He states something. 
we will discuss the kufr of the wretched, wretched Najdi about what Imam Muhalifa not being upon anything. Now, why does he, do he, does he say this, Imam Ali al Haddad? Because to deny the Imams and to deny or say these people are wrong or they're liars is kufr. Why? Well, because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the best generation is my generation, then those who come next, then those who come next. If you say, well, we don't follow these people, we're not in need of them, or they're wrong, or what have you, that's kufr, because you're denying the best of generations. So someone says, oh, Imam al-Hanifa, he's not upon anything. That can be kufr. That can be kufr. You say, oh, Imam, what did Imam Shafi know according to, you know, compared to today's scholars? That can be kufr. These, these are people that met the Prophet Wasallam's successors after him. It's not that easy just to say, well, that's the end of it, and these people are this, you know, نَحْنُنْ rijal wa hum rijal. We're men and they're men. Well, just barely. I mean, you have in common that you have the male gender, you have the Y chromosome, but that's all you have in common. In terms of what they established, what they built, all their books that we live by today, all of their books, we cannot do without Imam Shafi's books on usul. You will not find in terms of usul fiqh, no one's written as many usul fiqh books as the Hanafis have. No one. No one. They've written the most usul fiqh books out of all the scholars of the different schools. Huge amount of books on Usul al all over the place. Followed by the Shafi's. You'll never find a group of ulama who's written more books on theology and creed and beliefs than the Hanbalis have. No one. They, they've cornered the market on it. You'll never find a group of scholars that have written more books on inheritance than the Malikis. They've cornered that market. You can't do without this, these books. So it gives you an understanding that... How are you going to write, write Islam anew when you can't dispense with these scholars? You can't get rid of the scholars of the schools because what will you write? What will you do for tafsir? What will you do for Qur'an? You can't even read from the Qur'an without having contact with the madhabs. Men of madhabs are the ones that put the, the, the actual dashing, the printing and everything else that's done. These are men of madhab. These are people that have madhab. The people that are responsible for tajweed and all the sciences of tajweed, they're people of madhab. You cannot get around following these people. All right. Brother, please continue from Imam Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad al-Ahsai. Imam Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad al-Ahsai, may Allah be pleased with him, considered the matter so serious, he, qual he qualified it by writing a book on the issue of creed. Okay, Imam Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad al-Ahsai is one of the great Hanafi scholars from Ahsa, which is central Arabia. Okay, please continue, brother. Imam Abu Abdullah ibn Dawood al-Basri, may Allah be pleased with him, in his one letter, Lightning and Thunder, the answer to the cursed Ibn Saud, advised. So from these issues with them in the claim to prophethood, this was manifested by him not explicitly by speech, but this was done implicitly so that the people would not reject it immediately and bear witness to, that, uh, to what the scholars have mentioned. What the scholars have mentioned is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the beginning of his affair was shown to, to have reached the level of false prophet and a liar of the same capacity as the Musaylama, Sajjah, the false prophetess. Al-Aswad, Al-Ansi, uh, Dulayha, Al-Asadi and others. As for his father, he was a pious man. Now think about this. The scholars understood Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in his time, they knew him. They said, this man is at the same level as Musaylima. This is a false prophet. Everyone knows Musaylima al-Kadhab. Tulayha al-Asadi. Sajjah, the false prophetess. Al-Aswad al-Ansi. Everyone understood this man is a false prophet. He's a false teacher. Nowadays, that's been lost. When you say information like this, Astaghfirullah, brother, I've read such and such book and he's just calling for Quran and Sunnah. No, brother, you need to read a bit more. We need to understand matters a bit more because now we're living in an age in which this is an age of conciliation. Come on, brother, let's sit down, let's unify. It's not the time for this. You know, we're suffering in Iraq, we're suffering in Afghanistan. It's the time to unify. No, part of the reason for the suffering in Iraq, for the suffering in Afghanistan, is because of this. And we can't get around that. All right? Brother, please continue with Imam Nasr ibn Sulaiman. Imam Nasr ibn Sulaiman ibn Shuhaim al-Zubar. Zubairi, Zubairi, may Allah be pleased with him. 
was another <coughs> enemy of the Muwahidun, uh, pulled and resisted it at every turn. Imam Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Gharib, may Allah be pleased with him, was another one of the scholars that spoke the truth against the movement. He was he was based in uh, Adir Adriya uh, during the Badakhun takeover and hid his hatred for for them at first. His test came when a stranger to the land came to Adiria uh, and uh, quizzed him about his creed and position on the organization now controlling his city. After winning the, the trust of the Imam, he was told that they were evil, mistaken, wrong, murderers, and guilty of calling Muslims unbelievers. The individual that came to the Imam showed himself to be a spy for the cult and reported his statements. The Muwahiddin uh, authorities seized him, checked his statements, and uh, checked the statements that he had made to be sure that he stood by them. And with bravery and valor uh, deserving of a true scholar, he affirmed the words that he had uttered to the spy. This act of boldness led the Imam Ibn Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Gharib's execution. Okay, so they murdered him. So the moment he said, listen, you said these about our people. You said our people are liars, they're murderers, everything else. Is this true? Yes. They killed him. So this is another person that was murdered by Salafia. So you understand there's a trail of blood leading from Salafia from that time all the way up until this time. The only reason why it's placid, like how we see in this city of Nottingham, Birmingham, and other places, the only reason why it's placid and it's not as vicious as it normally appears is, as I said, because they're scared of the kuffar and there's certain legal things in place they can't do anything. So this is one of the reasons why they're scared. Now, his son-in-law, Abdul Aziz ibn Hamid, may Allah be pleased with him, was a known opponent of the movement. He lived in the aftermath of pogroms and depopulations of several towns and villages. He declared them Khawarij, preached against the cult, but hid his faith. He would later be instrumental when Muhammad Ali Basha moved against the organization. Upon their first meeting, it was realized that Imam ibn, ha ibn Hamid had the same creed as the Basha, and even urged him on. Okay, what this is referring to is, when the time came when Mecca was taken over, Mecca, the curtains to the Kaaba were burned by al Muwahidun when they took over. Medina was shelled, and the people were starved for so long they ate the dogs in Medina. This is how much they were starved. There used to be dogs in Medina. They ate the dogs. They were that hungry. Muhammad Ali Basha was actually, he had green eyes, a big red beard. He was an Albanian. He was, he was described by British authorities who were afraid of him as a Hanafi warlord because he was a decorated mujahid from the Ottoman military. And he was a massive man. He was a huge, he had a massive barrel chest, a big Albanian, and took over Egypt. And when he heard that uh, what had happened, the Ottoman authorities said, we will leave it to you to do with whatever must be done. Now by this time, Muhammad Abu Wahhab had died. He gathered a huge army, a massive army, and he just laid waste to that movement, al Wahidun. He destroyed Ad Dariya, and then he laid salt on the earth and set fire to it, and rotivated and turned over the earth. If you read Sultan Araf, this is a smaller version of what the angel Jibreel salam, did with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. When a land is cursed, it's set on fire and it's burned and it's overturned and the soil is put upside down. That's exactly what he did. The leaders of Salafia were then taken over to Istanbul. Their heads were cut off. They were buried in a mass grave and not prayed on. Do you understand what that means? If someone's head is executed, they're executed, they're buried in a mass grave and you don't pray on them. That means the ruling on those people is that they are murtaddin, they are kuffar. This is what the Ottoman authorities, these are the people in charge of the Ummah's affairs, the scholars as well, that signed the death warrants. Some of them survived, particularly Muhammad Abdul Wahab's grandson, Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan. He survived because he said, I repent, I, I repent from my beliefs. And he was put in jail in Egypt. But in Egypt, he began to propagate that theology because he hadn't really repented. 
But the ones that went to Istanbul, every single one of them, Saud ibn Abdul Aziz was executed. There's one picture of him, and you see him in chains, and it says Saud ibn Abdul Aziz before execution. That's the only picture you have of him. That's it. They buried him. As for the lay people of Salafiyyah, they tried to re-educate them, tried to guide them. ad dariyah was destroyed. If you go to Arabia today, and you go to ad dariyah no one lives there. The lakes are polluted. The palm trees are uh, bending, and they're rotten, fetid looking. It's supposed to be some historical landmark. It's horrible looking. They tried to rebuild it. It looks despicable. And this is what's happened. Now, Ibn, Imam Ibn Jadid, and Najdi, may Allah be pleased with him, was another enemy to the organization who stood against him with his teacher, Imam Muhammad ibn Fayruz of Hanbali. The reader might imagine that in light of all this opposition from some of the most brilliant minds of the Muslim world, those distorting the faith might pull back and reflect. But as is the case with Shaitan, he makes the deeds of the false teachers and prophets fair seeming in their own eyes. Wars continued between Muslim orthodoxy and the cults, with the laity, scholars, and notables being targeted by Muhammad Abdul Wahhab and the Brotherhood hordes. Scholars that rejected his statements were either tortured relentlessly after capture or killed on sight. In one incident, a young girl came stating that she had committed adultery against her husband and was subsequently murdered. Rather than hand her over to the judges to rightly examine and dispense the judgments of Allah, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab made a number of checks and then had her stoned to death himself. The scholars blatantly rejected this vigilantism and, fur and resisted further atrocities committed by the Najdi Sheikh. Now, this is footnote number 137. Okay, Brother Kashif, could you read this footnote? <coughs> Those opposed to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and were his contemporaries addressed him as thus, as do even his followers and devotees to this day. However, the Orthodox understood a different connotation when using this word. In the Sirah of Ibn Sham, volume 2, page 88 to 90, Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, was quoted as saying, When the idol worshippers of Mecca gathered together, they entered into the Darul Nadwa so they could hold counsel about the Messenger of Allah and decide what action to take. This took place in the daytime, as it was their custom, and the day on which they gathered was known as the Day of Mercy. Iblis came to them in the form of a noble looking old man wearing a thick cloak. He waited by the door of the building, and when they saw him waiting, they asked, Who is waiting at the door? Who is this sheikh? He replied, It is a sheikh from the people of Najd. This figure was later identified as having been Shaitan or Iblis himself, who came into the parliament of Nadwa and directed their affairs, assisting others in their attempt to destroy Islam. It should also be remembered that this same figure also appeared during the time when the Prophet was putting putting stone back into the base of the Kaaba after arbitrating a matter. This Najdi Sheikh figure interfered and objected as he believed the Quraysh and their arbitration to be better. PCC of Ibn Sham, volume 2, page 88 to 90 for details of both events in the main body of the text and also the historical footnote at the bottom. Now, this is serious. So when, so when Sunnis say the Najdi Sheikh, they mean it in this connotation. This is what they mean, that this is the same thing. This is the same Najdi Sheikh that appeared in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu In other words, Shaitan, this is the same one. When they say it, they mean it in an honorific fashion. But when the Sunnis say it, they say, no, this is the Najdi Sheikh. This is the, the Satanic Sheikh. This is him. And this is the reality of what's happened. Now, Ibn Abdul Wahhab's response to the resistance was to say the Imams from every method have agreed on the fact that whoever should seize a land or set up territories then possesses the judgment of the chief Imam in all things. If this was not the case, the whole world would have not been set aright. The reason for this is that the people for a long time before Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal all the way to our time have not agreed upon one Imam. It is not known that any of the scholars ever mentioned that any of the judicial rulings are not valid except by a grand Imam. However, the enemies of Allah make this doubtful matter a proof in answering something that they cannot reject, just as I've been ordered to stone the woman that committed adultery. What he's saying is, he has gone against the authority of the Ottomans and the others and made himself the ruler and the leader in all things. Because they believed that the Ottomans were uh, apostates because they were not proper uh, Muslims, and they used to refer to them as Qubudiyun. This word in English is translated grave worshippers. You've heard it. You've heard it. 
You've, if you haven't been called it, you've heard it used. These people are grave worshippers. And this is how they refer to the Ottomans. These people are grave worshippers. And so stay away from them. And so Muhammad Abdul Hab, when he took control of Arabiya and those sections, he gave the bay'ah to Muhammad ibn As-Saud. And he was subsequently made Muhammad ibn Saud Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is why when you look on books or anything released by, uh, <clears throat> you look at what's been released by, say, King Fahd, or all the rulers since the beginning when they took over in 1953, you'll see next to their name, it will say, Sahibul Jalala, the possessor of all majesty. Sahibul Jalala. You see this on the old books. Look at the old books of Fahd and Khalid. Sahibul Jalala. Even people that say, oh, Faisal, he was the good one. Did he? Did he have Sahibul Jalala by his name? Yes. And then there's another one. They'll, under their name, they'll have Imam al Haramain. Or the Sahib al Haramain, or the Khadim al Haramain, the possessor of the two harams. This is normally a word that would be used for the Khalifa. And we remember that when Muhammad al Wahhab took over, one of the first things he did is he banned the mentioning of the Khalifa's name in the khutbah. And he cursed him. He said, oh, this man's a rebellious sinner. Don't use his name in the khutbah. Something that had been done years before. So you must understand, what is coming was not something that was peaceful. The scholars responded by saying that the judicial punishment are not established except by the permission of the imam and those like him. Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, in a bizarre attempted refutation, <coughs> responded by saying... If this speech of theirs was true, their leadership in giving judgment, headship for them and others, would not have been valid. As Muhammad Abu Wahhab's forces depopulated towns, destroyed hamlets, and killed scholars, Imam Suleiman Abu Wahhab and so many other scholars banded together and began to fight defensively in the year 1165 onwards. The war was long and difficult, and so many heroes fell by the sword, a separate volume could be written on this fact alone. Huray Milat, one of the major fronts for warfare, was, was consistently known for this. Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, in a clear statement, wrote his older brother for the first time after his missionaries failed to bring a response from the father. The beginning of his letter was even without the statement, in the name of Allah, the most merciful and most compassionate. It was a clear declaration of war. The opening statement is just as ominous as it was then. Now listen to this statement of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. This is on page 47. Some doubts have been raised by one of those who claim knowledge from the people of Al-Uyayna, this is Suleiman, due to the apostasy of the people of Hurri Milat. So the Shaykh was asked to write some words that Allah would bring some benefit with them, and so he began his statement. So he starts by saying, not only is the Shaykh an apostate, but the people of Hurri Milat, that's a whole province. That's a city and a whole province. They're Kufar as well. They're Kufar as well. Now, once the people in the two towns of al Uyayna and Hurimila were declared apostates in mass, there was no further reason to respect them as Muslims or even as human beings. Hurimila in the year 1168 was the scene of a bloody battle, and the city was devastated in the course of the fighting. In the aftermath, Imam Suleiman, the chief Qadi among all the ruins, left the ruins, headed on to defend the region of Sudayr, which was now wide open for the Muwahidun group. Numerous assassination attempts were made against Imam Suleiman, the most famous of which involved a mentally unstable young man who used to hit anyone he came into contact with face to face. Once spies for al muwahidun had located the whereabouts of Imam Suleiman in his favorite masjid, the trap was set. Attempts were made on his life in the market at home while he was asleep, but none of them had been successful. This plan would be complete. The madman was handed a sword by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and given access to his brother, Imam Suleiman, who was in the masjid alone and did not perceive any danger. The madman now walked into the clear where, his face, where he was face to face with Imam Suleiman ibn Abdul Wahhab. The plan was that his young man, this young man, would extinguish one of the brightest lights of Islam in that time. But something else happened. Something else happened on that night. Instead of killing him, the young man recognized him immediately, dropped the sword. When he noticed Imam Suleiman looking fearful, he said, Suleiman, do not fear. Indeed, you are from those who've been given safety. He repeated the statement a number of times and then left the building. Now this source I've quoted to you as Suhub al-Wabila ala Dara'ih al-Hanabila, volume 2, pages 679 to 680. But it's also, it's also quoted from all of the Salafi historical sources. <coughs> 
It's, it's from all of the main Salafi sources as well. They admit it. <coughs> they totally admit it. And when you ask them about it, they have no way of accurately refuting you because it's something that is historically known. It's not something that's deniable. Everything that I've been saying to you at the bottom of the page, there's quotes for it. Now, the battle between the cult and Muslim orthodoxy raged and Imam Suleiman of Abu Wahab was finally captured in the year 1190 and brought by force and in chains under duress to the Muwahidun kingdom of ad Dar'iyah. Abd al-Aziz ibn Muhammad, the temporal ruler of the time, presented the torture to injured Imam to the head of the religious establishment, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Imam Suleiman stayed the rest of his life chained in captivity. He outlived his older brother and died on the 17th of Rajab in the year 1208 or 1209. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the city. Imam Suleiman ibn Abdul Wahab and all the scholars with him that opposed his younger brother had never once accepted Ikhwan authority and died in this way. His son, Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Suleiman, continued the resistance in teaching. He was the teacher of many men and transcribed so many different books the manuscripts run into the hundreds. Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Suleiman learned from his father, transcribed his books, and added other books to that. The oldest transcribed copies of the Collected Digest of Legal Rulings by Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him in the Arabian Peninsula, come from none other than Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Suleiman, who took it in his chain from his father. Imam Uthman ibn Hunayn, a student at the time, mentioned a dream he had about the Imam. He saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in the Masjid at al Jaws Gharbi in Hunayza. In the dream, the Imam was praying just in front of one of the greatest men that ever lived. He was praying in front of the greatest man that ever lived. Imam Uthman ibn Humayn came to the Prophet وسلم, greeted him, sat down, and said nothing. The Prophet وسلم, pointed to Imam Abdul Aziz and said, this person here is the most righteous of his time. Imam Uthman ibn Humayn remarked, is he like how Ibn Umar was in his time? The answer given was yes. Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Suleiman rose to the position of Qadi and saw the lands of the Muslims taken back from the cult and retired from his post. He left the position to his son, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Aziz al Hanbali. As a youth, Imam Muhammad memorized every book he glanced at and was called the sign of the times <coughs> due to his knowledge and wisdom. He died at the age of 26 in the land of Al Ahsa in the year 1263, followed by his father a short time after. Now, what I want for you to what I want to look at now is what happened after Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Okay, we've got a graph here. And we want to look at the history of it. Here we have the graph. Where did Muhammad Abdul Wahab get his knowledge from in terms of looking at his books? Well, the Khawarij actually began with Muhammad al Amir al Sana'ani. Now, Muhammad al Amir al Sana'ani was a Yemeni. And he was the one that wrote the book, Tathir al I'tiqad an Idran al Ilhad, the purification of the creed from the filth of desecration. And in this book, he called the grave of the Prophet ﷺ the greatest idol and said that the Muslims that were there were guilty of satanic innovations. I'll have to bring them next week for your perusal. Muhammad Abdul Wahab, known as the Shaykh al Najdi, he lived from 1111 to 1206 AH. Now, he had a number of students, but almost all of them were his children. Suleiman al Sheikh, Hussein al Sheikh, Abdullah al-Sheikh, Hassan al-Sheikh, Abdul Rahman al-Sheikh, and Hassan al-Sheikh. These are all his, his students, but they're all his sons. These others were friends of his family, Ibn Bishr, Hussein ibn Aydan, and Hussein ibn Ghannam. Now here's something interesting. When Salafis will quote you history, they'll always use these people. Now here's the thing. If you say, well, I want to know such and such, your son is the greatest son that we've ever known, isn't he? And you ask his mother. Of course he is. You see, there's a problem with this. Because these are not independent sources. These men, Hussein ibn, ibn Ghannam, Ibn Aydan, Ibn Bishop, they traveled with Muhammad Abu Wahab and committed atrocities with him. But you know the good thing about them, though, is they know everything. How many women they raped, how many concubines they took, how many children they killed, how many palm trees they cut down, 
how many people they murdered. They take no, they even put how many, how long it took for the, the Kaaba's curtains to burn. How long they shelled Medina before the people surrendered. How many Medinans they killed. How they depopulated Ta'if and destroyed Ta'if as a city. They're really proud. These people are very proud of this. They're very proud of it. Now, the next one is how did the Muwahidun come to India? Because most of the reason of why you have this issue with the Ali Hadith, Deoband and Brelwi, you hear these words bandied about, is because of how it came to India. This is Shah Abdul Ghani al Dahlawi, Shah Abdul Qadir al Dahlawi, and Shah Abdul Aziz al Dahlawi. Now, these are the sons of Imam Wali Allah al Dahlawi. Anyone with any basic knowledge of Islam knows who that is. Great scholar, fantastic alim, Sunni. But his sons weren't. But his sons weren't. His sons, Shah Abdul Aziz al Dahlawi, he lived from 1245, he, lived, he died in 1245, uh, AH. Shah Abdul Qadir, who lived from 1167 to 1243, and Shah Abdul Ghani al Dahlawi. Do you know they were the first ones to say that India was Dar al Harb? It was a Kafir, it was a Kafir country. The Kafir country. This place is Dar al Harb. It's compulsory for the Muslims to leave this land. Now they had a number of students. One of their most important students, because they had, how had they been infected with Salafiyah? What, how did they get it? How did they have the Al Muwahidun or Ikhwan influence? They went on Hajj during the time that Al Muwahidun controlled that area. They became infected and came back to India. They became infected and came back to India. They were no longer Maturidi, they were no longer Hanafi. They were something totally different. Totally different. And it transformed the society of India. Now I want you to pay very careful attention because this is, if you can understand this, remember this is undivided India. So how Shaitan did this was just devastating. What happened to the people? The man that really got the ball rolling, his name was Sayyid Ahmed al Brelwi. This is not Imam Ahmed Rida Khan Brelwi. This is somewhat different. This is Sayyid Ahmed al Brelwi. He lived from 1201 to 1246 AH. Now, he was further, he was infected by them, but he went on Hajj himself and met the grandsons of Muhammad Abu Wahab. He founded a group called Tariqa Muhammadiyah. Tariqa Muhammadiyah. This group was founded around 1818. And one of the first things they stated was, uh, this was about 1230 AH. One of the first things they stated was, every Muslim is an absolute mujtahid. He is required to go back to the books. Quran and Sunnah must be gone back to. And the following of methods is shirk. It's not, oh, it's better if you didn't do this bid No, it's shirk. We have to stop this. Massive wars occurred between him and other Muslims and Sikhs. He went over to Afghanistan, nearly killed. Nearly killed. Because they're Hanafis, they haven't seen this yet. So the moment he comes there and says, oh, the methods are bidah shirk, kill him. Because they understood what proper Islam was. Let's kill this man. He escaped. Because he's actually, this man, Sayyid Ahmed al Brelwi, although he's, come, he's not from Uttar Pradesh, he's from Rai Brelwi, which is different. But they're both called al Brelwi. Now he's actually Patan, this man. And so we help to infect some of the other areas, along with another man, Ahmed Hassan Khan al Qanuji, who's also Patan. And by spreading these books in Persian and in Urdu and popularizing them, it made it possible to damage the Muslims in India. Here's another man, Haji Shariatullah. He was the founder of the Fara'idi movement, along with another man named Tito Mir. They're from Chittagong. And they were infected on Hajj, but were also damaged by Shah Abdul Aziz al Dahli. They became infected. Guess where they went to? Today's Bangladesh. Has anyone ever heard of the Fara'idi or the Faraizi movement? These are Bengali Salafis. And they came with the same ideas and infected and damaged the rest of the Muslims in their area. 
Now, I want to give you a breakdown of these people. <coughs> this is Sayyid Ahmed al Brelwi. Now, we want to look at who did he teach? Anayat Ali, Ahmed Allah, and then there was a man called Karamat Ali. Now, this is very, very, very important. Karamat Ali, you see, what happened with Tariqa Muhammadiyah is they split into three branches. They split into three branches. Karamat Ali was part of what's called the Patna Jama'ah. He was the smartest out of all of them because he said, what, what we should do is we should not try to destroy the Sunnis and denounce them outright because the people are rejecting it very quickly when we come to them with it. What we should do is still pretend to belong to the Methabs and introduce it slowly, which is easier. You have Abdul Hayyad Dahlawi, Farhat Hussein, Tito Mir, who founded the group uh, Shariati Muhammadi. Again, he's in Bangladesh, today's Bangladesh. You have Abdul Jabbar, who's the founder of the second Patna Jama'ah. He disagreed with Karamat Ali. He said, I don't accept this. This is wrong. <coughs> these people, we should work hard and push our doctrines hard. All of these men wrote books. All these men wrote books. Muhammad Yusuf al-Dahlawi, Ilahi Bakhsh, Awlan Hassan Khan al-Qannuji, who's the father of Sayyid Siddiq Khan al-Qannuji, who spread these ideas into Bhopal in India. So now it's in Bhopal in India. Then we have finally, well, second to last, Shah Muhammad Ismail al-Dahlawi, who was the writer of Taqwiyatul Iman. And that book is only an Urdu translation of Kitab al-Tawheed. That's all it is. And that book was not solely, but the majority responsible for the destruction of the creed of the people in that part of India. It destroyed their theology. And on the back of that came Wilayat Ali, who was part of a third jama'ah within Tariqa Muhammadiyah, which was called Muhammadi Jama'ah. They had a man that came after called Nadir Hussein, who renamed the group Ahli Hadith. Now he and another man, Thana'ullah Amr al-Sari, who's called Thana'ullah Amr al-Sari, guess where they're graduates from? They're graduates of Darul Loom Deoband. They're graduates. The Ahli Hadith came out of Deoband. And this is why you find Sunnis often say Deoband is the door to Salafiyah. Because they, came, they graduated out of Deoband. Now that, this is not saying all Deoband, because next week we'll have to deal with what happened with Deoband. This is not saying all of them, but in those, pro, in those beginning phases, Deoband had about five or six Masail of Salafia, a section of them. In fact, Sadiq Hassan Khan al son, Ahmed Hassan, was the rector in Lucknow University, Darul Nedwa. He was the rector at the Deoband University there. This man is a son of he's a rector at the university. And they had Muhammad Rashid Rida, who helped. He's the one that gave it at Dawah to Salafia. His teacher gave it that name. He went to Deoband and taught at their biggest Darul Ulum. He taught there. And had a massive impact. So what you're seeing here is what happened to Muslims in undivided India. Why did it split into these different jamaas? What happened? And it all comes back to this man, and it comes back to, originally, it leads from Muhammad al-Amir al-Sana'ani to Muhammad al-Abd al-Wahhab to his sons and his grandsons to these three men, Shah Abd al-Ghani, Shah Abd al-Qadr, Shah Abd al-Aziz. And he says, Shah, well, these people are supposed to be from the household of the Prophet Yes, but they can, things can happen to them as well. Things can happen to them as well. And this disease then spread and filtered to Bangladesh via Haji Shariatullah and Tito Mir, who both still kept claiming, we're Hanafis. So why are your beliefs totally different? No, we're Hanafis. Sayyid Ahmed al Rani, who was more bold and just came out and said, no, we don't follow any man at all. And then these men came out. He was the more intelligent, Karamat Ali, because he said, well, what it is, is we'll stay Hanafis. We'll pretend that we're Hanafis. And will spread the ideas easier that way. He was right as well. 
by pretending to still, oh, we're still with you, alhamdulillah, come in the masjid. It was much easier than having someone come in and demolish Islam in front of the people because what happened? What did the Muslims of undivided India do? They resisted it, they fought it. But when you came in and said, no, brother, we just want to help spread Islam, Allah, you shake their hands and you're lovely with them and you're having the dinner and the rice and the chicken is cooking and everyone is having a great time and you introduce it and you marry, you have one of their daughters marry one of your sons. So now you're married into the big families. This is what Sadiq Hassan Khan al Qanuji did. He went to Bhopal, married within them, and changed the education system. They used to have the Darsan Nizam Nizami, changed the entire education system. Destroyed it. Totally destroyed it. And now the fitna that the people in Bhopal have, and all the tribulations that they have, is because of this man who brought it. Now here's something interesting. Aulad Hassan, Hassan Khan Qanuji, who's actually the grandfather of Siddiq Hassan, they were Twelvers. They were Twelvers. And the first taste of what they thought was proper Islam was, was Ahl al-Hadith. You see how despicable this thing is? It spread. So from Muhammad Abu Wahab's death, from his grandsons and onward, this is what happened in India. And why India looks the way that it looks. The people that are receiving these titles, brevis or whatever else, these are actually the Sunnis. These are actually the Sunnis. Now, saying that, it doesn't mean that the Sunnis don't have some problems among them. But we're talking about foundational creedal beliefs. When you hear people talking about grave worshippers and uh, bidities and all this other business, these people, they worship the graves. There's too much bidet and all this other business. They're talking about Sunnis. They're talking about Sunnis. And the language that they use, I just don't like it when they worship the graves. But if they worship the graves, they're not Muslims anyway. Well, I'm not saying that. Some of them, they, they retrace their steps. But that's what this language teaches you, that yes, these people, they worship the graves, they're far, they're pagans. There's jahiliya practices that they have. These people are mushriks. Look out. And so, one of the first things Sayyid Ahmed al-Burabi did, and this is very interesting, he went on Hajj, and he came back smiling in his masjid, and he said, I've been on Hajj, and I didn't visit Rasulullah <laughs> This was to show that I've, I've completely broken ranks. This is not, this is the thing about the cults, there's nothing peaceful about them, because they, sta they stand on their own. I didn't visit him, I didn't do this. When I came back, I, I didn't visit him. And then what, what happened is he sent Tito Mir and other people that came and said, we went on Umrah and we didn't start in Medina. We didn't start in Medina. Because normally if you're going on Umrah, that's optional. So you would start in Medina. If you visit the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you go from Medina to Mecca. No, I did Umrah and I didn't start in Medina. It was a Nephil Umrah. Okay, so you lost out on a massive Sunnah. You didn't get any reward for that. Okay. But it was done to try to make a statement. These people wrote a flurry of books. Surat, they wrote a book called Surat al Mustaqim. Another one was called Taqwiyat al Iman, as we already discussed. Um, another one was Rad al Ishraq fi Ittiba' wa Taqlid, the refutation of shirk because of those who do taqlid and follow madhabs. The shirk. A number of other books. Inshallah, I will bring them next week. This week, I, I knew it was going to be heavy for me to bring them. Because I just had to get you used to this and to this. So just a very quick moment before we move on. Then. The Khawarij appearance in Arabia is coming from them. Then it goes here. Don't you ever wonder why when someone starts taking on those beliefs, they have the red and white doily on their head? Do you ever, don't you ever wonder why that is? Why they have that red and white cloth? It's because of these men. It's been popularized. And so now when some slaves of Allah think of proper Islam, they imagine the man sitting at the table, he's wearing the bisht, you know, the gold with the black robe, which actually Abu Jahl wore one of those. So why would you want to wear one? But that's an issue. And the red and white covering, and he's got the little part in the middle. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And when they speak, none of these people smile in their durus. They're angry, the whole durus. And somehow, somehow in the Darus, you're just talking about the sunnahs of the Miswak, 
And then somehow, some way, you come back to this topic of shirk and bid'ah. It could be any topic. It doesn't matter what it is. Today, brothers, you want to talk about the importance of good character. Now, obviously, with shirk in your life, good character is not... I mean, just how did we get from talking about this to shirk? It's a totally different attitude. How they view the ummah, how they view the vast majority of Muslims. They see them as people who have to be converted, who have to be brought back to Islam. I've got to sort you out. I've got to straighten you out. There's too much shirk in your tarheed. If you have any. This is the situation. So we're looking now at <coughs> life after Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Indeed, the scholars of Muslim Orthodoxy poured out their blood as a true sacrifice in these dark days. Some felt the sword of the assassin and fell as martyrs, while others were captured and tortured. Still others were free and continued preaching regardless, sometimes taking up arms against the theological system, seeking to overthrow Muslim governance. In the year 1206, the year 1206 witnessed some of the worst fighting imaginable, and was also the year the Muwahidun's founder, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, was buried and prayed upon by his group and left in an unmarked grave. The Brotherhood group in 51 years had depopulated several towns and cities, forcibly converted Bedouin tribes, and also shelled Mecca and Medina, stopping the annual pilgrimage for two years. Now, you can look this up in the Telegraph in the London newspaper. They stopped the Hajj for two years. Muslim, this Ummah for two years couldn't do Hajj. For two years they stopped the Hajj. If anyone wants to see the proofs, I've got them at the house, I'll bring them. And they're from Salafi sources. They're in the newspaper as well, where even the unbelievers said, there seems to be some disturbance because the Mohammedan period of Hajj has been called to a halt. Even the unbelievers were, what's going on out there? To stop Hajj for two years. You know, that's been prophecy, that, that's, that this would happen. It was prophecy that this would happen. It was the first time in history the Hajj for two years, no one could get there. The Egyptians tried to come, they killed the first Muharimin, the first Hajjis from Egypt that came, because they came bringing the Kiswa. Because it used to be that the Kiswa was redone in Egypt. And they would do the Kiswa, and there'd be this grand ceremony where they would walk with it all the way to Mecca, killed them. Then the bodies of the Muharimin were destroyed. Other people found out they came from Sham and they returned back. They said, no, do you believe in this creed and that creed? Well, no, we don't. Well, until you, until you have proper tawheed, you can't make hajj. No shirk in your tawheed. And they returned back. The Iraqis returned back. The Yemenis returned back. They're like, well, how are we going to? The Indians returned back. It happened to the point where it was so serious. It happened again at the time of Imam Ahmed al Khan. Where it happened again. But he said, let the boat go ahead anyway. And they risked their lives. They could have been killed making hajj. They could have been killed. That's how it was back then. You actually literally were in physical danger making hajj. After the death of Muhammad Abdul Wahab, his sons and grandsons succeeded him as religious head over the Muwahidun establishment. The successors included Abdullah al Sheikh, Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan, and others. They sent out the same threatening letters and received the same unanimous response. We've quoted a few of them below for the reader to also have for his or her records. Imam Ahmad al-Sawi, may Allah be pleased with him, the great Maliki judge and jurist, said of the movement, Allah has said, humanity, the promise of Allah is true, so do not be deceived about the life of this world and do not let the deceiver lead you astray about Allah. This ayah is said to have been sent down regarding the Khawarij, who corrupted the meaning of the book and the sunnah and did this to make the blood and wealth of Muslims permissible to be spilled and taken. This very thing can be witnessed now in their companion in a cult that appeared in Al-Hijaz by the name of the Wahhabis. They think that they are upon something, but they are liars. Shaytan has taken hold of them and caused them to forget the remembrance of Allah. These people are the group of Shaytan. Are not the group of Shaytan the losers? We ask Allah the generous that he wipe them out and exterminate all trace of them from the land. Does this sound like soft language? It's hard language. This is what the ulama is saying. Now we come to Imam Muhammad ibn Abidin. This is the foremost resource on Hanafi fiqh. This is the number one resource on the final rulings in the Hanafi school. Listen to what he says about the movement of Muhammad Abdul Wahab. He says, Now the situation is just as what happened in our time with the followers of Muhammad Abdul Wahab. They exited out from Najid, took over the sacred precincts, and they at one point tried to attach themselves to the madhab of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. But they believed that they were the only Muslims and that those who opposed them were idol worshippers. By doing this, they declared the killing of the scholars and laymen of Muslim orthodoxy is permissible. And this continued until Allah the Exalted broke their power base, <coughs> broke their power base and destroyed their place, and the armies of the Muslims were victorious over them in the year 1233. 
Okay, that's the year that Muhammad Ali Basha took over. And the Kaaba had to have the Kiswa relayed. Masjid al Nabawi had to be rebuilt again. There were cannonball holes in the, uh, the actual work of al Masjid al Haram. It happened again in 1925 when they took it over again, when they finally took over the peninsula. There were cannonball holes in al Masjid al Haram. That's why they've been Laden and Co. have had to do all this rebuilding. Because they damaged and destroyed the Masjid. It's not because, oh, mashallah, they love the Kaaba. No, it's, we have to rebuild it because we almost destroyed the thing. Imam Ahmed al Dayyaf, may Allah be pleased with him, in the year 1229, he received great news about the ultimate Khilafah taking the sacred precincts of Mecca and Medina back from the cult of Muhammad Abu Wahab and his followers. And when it was announced, it was a relief and great news to everyone. When a message was sent to Tunis from this group, it was advised by Abu Muhammad Mahmoud Bashir that this be answered. The answer came from Imam Abu Fidda Ismail al Tamimi, who wrote a long book called The Divine Portents and explaining the astrayness of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Imam Abu Hafs Omar al-Maliki also wrote a book on them. And this man is the splendor of the Madhab and torchbearer of the school in this age. <laughs> the Imam then said, So when this reply was sent, the successor of Muhammad Abu Wahab did not answer, but he continued in his warfare and killing. Okay? Brother, could you please read from Imam Hassan al shalti Imam, Imam Hassan al shalti may Allah be pleased with him mention. <coughs> I have read this general message with regard to the matter of review law as it relates to some doubts that were raised by some ignorant people who do not necessitate kufr in principle, while some of it may be beneficial in consideration. Ibn Abdul Wahhab, who de has declared them to be unbelievers due to this action as stated in his letter, in addition to his declaring their blood and wealth licit for spilling and seizure, this belief was reached due to what appeared to lay people by the outward import of explicit of explicitly worded texts of revealed law built upon their founders' ignorance, hatred, and bad thoughts about the believers. May Allah curse whoever has this creed, for indeed, whoever declared a believer to be an unbeliever has already committed kufr. Okay, you understand? This is serious. May Allah curse whoever has this creed. This means, whenever you use the word la'na, that means that it's eternal divine punishment. This is only used when someone is outside of the religion. It's understood this person is outside of the religion. This is why you don't say, Lanatullahi Ali, may Allah's curse be upon him, unless it's someone, this is confirmed this one's a Catholic. Like, for example, in the case of Shaitan or things like this, you wouldn't say this to another believer. This is what the scholars believed about Muhammad Abu Wahhab and his grandsons. This is what they believe. Please read further. Imam Muhammad ibn Humayd, alhamdulillah, may Allah be pleased with him in his low hanging clouds over the graves of Hanbalis informs us, this man, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, is the bringer of this call, this call whose evil has spread and engulfed the horizon of darkness. It is clearly mentioned in history that he did not begin to propagate his ideas publicly whilst his father was alive. Imam Dawood ibn Sulaiman al-Khalidi, may Allah be pleased with them, made the following remark. There have been some people that have appeared in our time opposing Muslim, Muslim orthodoxy and the madhabs while leading astray the Ummah of Muhammad and declaring the blood and wealth of these Muslims to be permissible for spinning and seizure. This group took filthy and dark doubts and used them to sur surround people. I then sought the help of Allah to answer them with these few pages that I wrote so that Allah would guide them and that a wonderful intercession this would be for me. Okay, now, this is... The end note, I say, is it is truly the hope of the writer of these words that the reader reflects on the sacrifices that these noble sages made. If not for them, what would have remained of the truth of Islam? Today we are being tortured by the same evil disease that we must rise to meet the challenge of Shaitan and those allied with him knowingly or unknowingly. Okay, I finished this book. This was over three years of research. And I said in the, in the 87th year of the Holy Land captivity. So it's been 87 years since a Masjid al-Haram and a Masjid al nabawi have been in their control. 87 years. So I, I consider those places in captivity. Okay, our sacred lands are in captivity. They've been taken over by a satanic bestial force, and they're in captivity. Um, in rounding off today's festivities, then, I say the following. Next week, inshallah, next week, inshallah, we'll be starting the text. But I wanted you to come to this understanding in the introduction that this is where we are right now. That's why I laid out this introduction. It took me two weeks to just lay out this introduction to understand the reason why you're having problems at your local ISOC. The reason why when you go to university, you go to the local ISOC 
please come, sister, come. Hear, hear a lecture. You get energized. You go home. You feel you have to correct your parents, and then they correct you. You get in an argument with your mom and your dad. Almost get thrown out. Why? Because of these beliefs. People fill your head with ideas and make you believe that your parents, the people who raised you and put all the effort into you, are mushriks. These people have been praying longer than you've been alive. There's people teaching you these people are mushriks. They're kafirs. Look out. And so you, na'udhu billah, start to mistrust your own parents, your own family. You think your uncle's got shirk. All these other issues. And this is what is being taught by these people. Now what we have to do is, because they're calling us away from the jama'ah of the Sunnis, we have to investigate them and say, what are these people about? What do they want? And there's no better example than when it comes from family. They'll know. This is what the situation is. So in closing all this off, I want to leave you with this. If anyone wants copies of these graphs, inshallah, I can get them to you. I can give you a no charge. Um, these graphs accurately give you a picture of how this movement spread. So you have the sons, then you have the grandsons. So when you see this expression, ala sheikh, after the name, like if you are going on, you're doing some fetwa shopping online, and you come across, oh yes, I'm just going to go to this website, ask them a question. Not that I endorse that, but let's say you did, just for curiosity's sake. Oh, this question is being answered by Abdul Aziz al Sheikh. Oh look, he's a descendant of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. That should set off your Islamic spidey sense straight away. The top of your head should be burning, the hairs on the neck, that feeling that you've ran a razor over your face the wrong way. That should all be happening when you receive this. If you're speaking to someone and they tell you there's some really good books you need to read, Oh, really? Yes. And they're even in Urdu as well, so you can give them to your mother. Oh, who wrote them? This one right here. It's by Shah Muhammad Ismail al Dehlawi. It will really help you in your tawheed. This is an alert, dead, dead alert. Don't bring those books home to your mom because you're only going to get in trouble. You take them, find a quiet, calm place, and burn them. That's what you do. Peaceful place, burn these books. They're filth. They're filth. Now next week we're going to talk about the beliefs that are in these books and I'm actually going to bring a sample of the literature that I've collected over 10 years of watching this cult. I'm going to bring it to literature so you can actually physically see the books because it seems kind of crazy for me to say these things right now. You're reading the quotes, but when you actually see them from the books yourselves, when you actually see them, when you actually see them from the books themselves, you say to yourself, subhanAllah, like, for example, in one of the books, it states, there's a statement in one of the books, I will give this as sort of a taster, where Imam Tahawi, a great Sunni scholar, says, Allah is not in need of any limits and cannot be contained by the six directions. Footnote at the bottom, one of the major Salafi figures, he says, this means limits that we know, but only he, Allah, knows his own limits. Think, no, this must have been a printing error. There can't be no one in their right mind would say that Allah has limits. This is kufr, it's clear. Everyone intelligent person knows this. It must be a printing error. I felt the same way. So I bought three editions of the book from three different years. And you know what? It's still in there. Or when someone speaks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say, well, Allah is above his throne. And there's a section. This only means sitting. So, no, this is kufr. No one in their right mind could write that. That's why I've brought the book for you. So you can see for yourself. Because it seems fanciful, the things I'm saying. A statement in one of the books, Taqwiyah to the Iman. Do you know that you can commit? There's a, there's a question. Shirk in your daily chores. You're just cleaning the house, minding your own business. Did you know you could be doing shirk while you're doing your daily chores? This is, this is the type of paranoia that it creates. So next week, inshallah, there will be a large black garbage bag, a hefty garbage bag, with books inside. And we're going to take a look at these as we go through and as I'm quoting, as the author is speaking about the books, I'll give the place where the author is quoting them from, and then I will pull out each individual book so you can see physically that this book exists. Because it's a serious thing. Because both parties are right. Muhammad Abdul Wahab says, listen, if you don't believe as I do, you're a kafir. And the ulama have said, listen, if you believe as he believes, you're a kafir. So they can't both be right. Someone's wrong. 
And we have to get to the bottom of this. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم استغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم الحمد الرحيم. Is there any question over what we've covered so far today? Is there any question? Any question? No. Okay. So what I will say then is next week come with your mind attuned, prepared. If anyone wants copies of these, how many of you can get them? Come with your mind attuned. I will have to leave these books because they're so heavy. I'll just leave them here for the duration of the class that we're doing, just so you can see them. And you'll see something interesting I want to mention. Did you know that Taqwiyya to Liman, this book that's been brought, that's originally in Urdu, has been brought into English, do you know that the Saudi kingdom gives those as gift sets with Kitab al-Tarheed and Salafi books? You get them as a gift set. Married women, when they get married there, they say, oh, this is a gift. Converts, when they come to Islam, this is a gift from us. To you, we love you. We want you to be guided. So you don't have any shirk in your tower. He, are you Pakistani? Pakistani? Okay, you, you need these. <laughs> Make sure that, whew, almost lost you there. Because this is the type of way that they really do believe that you're Mushriks. And so we have to talk about why. Okay? So we'll close from here. Subhanakallahum wa hamdika wa shahadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk innahu ghafurur rahim. Assalamu alaikum.